Difficulty is weird. Fuck it. Let's try it. I do like a good fucking gaming video. I'll tell you that. Hardest decisions I find myself faced with when playing a game is this one. It's almost always the mm. first choice you make, and it is one of the biggest deciding factors on what kind of experience you're going to. It's extra tough if you're streaming. I want to tell you this. <laughs> I had a long conversation with XQC about this, <laughs> where his theory is that everyone is going to call you a pussy if you don't pick hardest. But if you pick hardest, they'll leave because the game takes too long to get through. So what you should do is pick the absolute easiest and force it down mid. Don't read any dialogue and just try to beat it day one. That was that was XQC's plan. That's what he told me. He said, this is the big streamer way to do it is pick the easiest possible difficulty, force it down mid to get through the cutscenes, and then everyone watches it day one, which he, he's probably onto something. Cause there's like, like, I've noticed that if you play a game, once you get to day two or three, people haven't watched all the farts and they get, they churn out cause they don't understand what's going on. So it's a real thing, but also I am susceptible to my own personal brain rot where it's like, I want to pick the hardest one. I did that even before I streamed, but it's even worse when you stream because you're like, you want to just do the hardest thing. I don't know. It's a tough call. I've never really tried the other way, but I think I, I do want to try like not going to have. For the longest time, it's something I never paid much mind to, always just selecting normal or whatever seemed to be its equivalent, because I figured that must be the intended experience. Like it's literally called normal, so you'd assume the game must be best balanced around that mode. But more recently, I've realized that's not always the case. One example of this that I've touched on a bit in the past can be seen with The Witcher 3. Its normal option, Story and Swords, provides a decent challenge and certainly will be a good option for some, but I found it to be underwhelming as I was able to pretty easily beat the game without engaging with most of its systems. Aside from a few tutorial quests that- I mean, this is why I really fucking love games that have no difficulty level. I don't even like the choice. The choice already annoys me. I like a game that's hard, but there's no other way to play it. <laughs> so it's just like, that's what you have to just deal with it. I don't like having the option of, oh, he's probably gonna talk about this, but whatever, I wanna, <laughs> like Paper Mario. <laughs> Yeah, like Paper Mario, okay? A game that's fucking brutally difficult, but with no way to turn it down. So that like, it's a gauntlet that I must go through by myself to use alchemy and the bestiary, I pretty much ignored them entirely, because in the time it would take me to read up on a monster's weakness and create an oil or decoction to- Wait, the exception is Pokemon because the difficulty in that is so easy, it's- Yeah, I agree. I actually would love if Nintendo, just for once, God damn it, Nintendo and Game Freak, just for once, dude, make a fucking serious, hardcore Pokemon game. Just try making it for the fans that have been around for 20 years. It would be so sick. Just a really fucking good one with like side quest bosses and fucking shit that's really challenging and Pokemon that are fucking super hard to catch and just shit that like makes you, God, it would be so sick. They are games for little kids. They were games for little kids, okay? Pokemon has fans of all ages now. There's, there's more than one audience it can support. To help me take it out, I could have already killed it and been on to the next one. Using those mechanics didn't feel worth my time. I want to see Pokemon disfigured after fights. That's not what I said. I meant difficulty hard. I don't mean fucking Pikachu's eye gets torn out. I don't mean Mortal Kombat fatalities in it, dude. I just want, I want a difficult challenge that requires you to actually learn the mechanics of the game and not just pick Squirtle or the equivalent at the beginning and solo level it the whole game and one shot everything. I want like the teams to matter which is a bummer because they're interesting systems that encourage exploring and engaging with the world and lore in meaningful ways. They are an important piece of what makes The Witcher 3's gameplay loop feel so good, but as I didn't use them, I missed out on most of that, and once I finished my first playthrough, I walked away feeling bored and unimpressed. Then last year, after a handful of failed attempts of getting back into it on a higher difficulty, I finally fully dedicated myself to a Death March playthrough, and it felt like an entirely different game. All of the mechanics I once ignored became integral to my success, as certain fights were simply impossible without them. Right. It encouraged a playstyle that pushed me to learn about the world and think carefully about every encounter, making me feel like a witcher instead of a typical video game hero. And this made it so much more distinct from most other open world games I've played. Now, I don't think Death March. Is Raz in chat? Is there any chance? Sometimes he's in chat. Because I wanted to ask, he really is a gamer. In terms of like, just, I'm going to go back and replay a game. I'm going to play a single player game again. I'm going to just take two weeks and play The Witcher again on hardcore. Like he games. Playing across genres, playing new games, and then playing the same games again. Which is like, I very rarely play a single player game again. And I wanted to ask if now that it's sort of his job, if he feels more pressure to do it. Now, you know what I'm saying? Like, did he do The Witcher 3? playthrough out of love before YouTube just wanted to do it or does he I wonder I wonder how that changes things for him and I'm interested
which fixes every issue with the game or its combat, but at the very least, it got me to approach it in a much more enjoyable way than I did the first time. The thing is, if I hadn't read up on it and been told by friends to give Death March an honest shot, I never would have known to try it. And even if I had decided to start with it unprompted, I would have changed difficulties almost immediately, because the first encounter absolutely wrecked me. Like, I died over five times to these stupid ghouls. On Death March, they have the capability to take you out in just a few hits, and as you don't have any notable gear or items, there are no advantages to lean on. Also, Bro, given my pretty simple- I did, uh, I remember I did Resident Evil, what was it, 8? Hardcore, the hardest mode on stream. The very first fucking fight in the village. <laughs> That village, I spent like a fucking day, dude. Get to the river. <laughs> I remember just running in circles in that fucking village over and over and over and over and over again on hardcore because they were all bullet sponges. I had one little pistol and I didn't understand that you had to like, you had to die in the right spot. That scripted death. Oh, so fucking annoying. God, that was crazy experience on story and swords i wasn't used to needing to dodge so frequently or wait for openings to attack so yeah, it, it was the hardest part of the whole game those things down had this been my first playthrough i would have made the very fair assumption that i was in over my head as dying so many times during what is for all intents and purposes still part of the tutorial is a pretty clear sign that you should turn the difficulty down but in reality death march isn't nearly as punishing as this first encounter makes it out to be to be honest i struggled more with this fight than any other i came across throughout my hundred plus hour playthrough and the only thing that killed me more than these ghouls was crappy. <laughs> my there. whole experience with been the Witcher there. 3 illustrates one of the bigger issues that comes from having difficulty options if players don't pick the right one i it... forgot the reason i brought that question up for raz and the reason i'm thinking about it is because i played witcher 3 and really loved it before i was a content creator i just played it i just sat down and played it and i enjoyed it and i explored the world but i would never play it the same way on stream and i don't think i would even enjoy it the same way on stream like if witcher 3 came out today i think i would skip it <laughs> Which is kind of sad. Like, that's not fun. And I have never even played, I never played Blood and Wine. Because Blood and Wine came out later, and I heard it was good, but I just... And I would have, I think, if I was in a different spot. So I guess I'm interested. I wonder if that has changed his perspective or not. But yeah, I think I should play it. I mean, I'd love to play it, but it's just not a stream game, and I always feel like it's... The thing, when I first started streaming, early pandemic at NVIDIA, the real appeal of it to me was not anything about a community or anything about building an audience or whatever. It was because I had this voice in my head whenever I would play video games that says you're wasting time. But when I did it on a stream, the voice was not there. It was like, this is good, You're it's a content. <laughs> and so I was able to just play games and it was fine. Not schizo, <laughs> not schizo. I'm just saying that's, that is what the appeal was to me of streaming. But now it's like a different voice now where it's like, this is a bad stream game, which is interesting. It's an interesting evolution. There's almost no escaping the cycle. I'm still gonna beat Liza P and I played a ton of Liza P knowing that was not a good stream game. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm, it's entirely. I'm just saying I'm now, it's like, it's like once you know a fact, you can't erase it from your memory. You can't pretend you don't know it. And it's my brain is just aware of that thing, which is annoying. I have to like, I have to like tell myself to ignore it rather than it can turn Just a game they would have otherwise really loved into one that never manages to impress them. And it all starts with having to make a guess of which setting will be right for them. If it were just about players having to assess their skill level in any given genre, that'd be hard enough. But they also have to contend with the fact that every title is balanced differently. And a hard mode in one game is it's not- It's also, I'm sorry, I'm, go, I'm talking all about me here, but I'm, just, I'm contextualizing this through my thoughts. It's also not a, it's not an impossible problem. Like it's technically a problem I could solve by getting better at doing what Northern Lion does. Northern Lion has solved this problem and it's because he has figured out how to banter completely irrelevant to the game. He literally doesn't have to care about the game, which is a great, so he can, it doesn't actually matter. He can kind of choose what he wants to play. And even then he abandoned some stuff. Uh, some games that don't work for viewership. So there is a solution to this problem. Like the problem is I like talking about the game generally. Not all the time, but I generally like talking about the game. So it's like something I gotta work on. So like if I want to do it and I want to, if I want to have all my cake and eat it too, I have to work on that. Not um, the same as a hard mode in another. Honestly, when it comes to The Witcher 3, I still don't know if the reason I like Death March so much is because I'm an above average player or because CD Projekt Red did a bad job of picking out what their default mode should be. When playing something new, the only thing I can really base my decision off of is what difficulty level I went with yeah, for there's other a tough games. Way, yeah. And even though it might get me close a lot of the time, it obviously is a flawed way to do it because it is 
using irrelevant information. It takes actually playing something to have any real idea, but as I already pointed out with the ghouls, even that can be misleading. An early lull or spike in difficulty can give an inaccurate what depiction of that? what a setting will be like to play long term. The logical that? solution to this problem is to just switch difficulties throughout oh. a playthrough. When things start to feel mindless, bump it up, and when it seems like you're constantly bashing your head against the wall, turn it down. But I no, find I hate that, that this I hate is that. easier said than I hate done. That. For instance, I like the feeling I get from overcoming challenging games. Yeah. So when I run into an obstacle that seems out of my league, a part of me always wants to figure out how to get past it. Even though I don't think I should feel this way, lowering the difficulty seems like a sort of failure. Yeah. It's me giving up on the chance yeah. to enjoy the sweet satisfaction. And what's worse is I hate that it even exists. When I'm streaming, I don't worry about it because I would never do it live. But if you're offline and you're stuck on something, the thought that you could, I don't know, that you could skip over it by going to easy pisses me off. <laughs> it like frustrates me. I don't even want to have to think about it. I don't even want the option for it. I wish it didn't exist. I wish it was balanced around everyone. You know what I'm saying? I, I'm pissed off at the option. I really am, which is I, I, again, probably not fair, but I'm just being honest about my emotion. I don't like having to, to make the choice of getting good. There are times where it's obvious that I should just switch, so I do, but more often than not, I feel inclined to just keep pushing through it, to keep trying regardless of how frustrating it gets. Putting this much effort into conquering a challenge certainly can pay off. But with some titles, it really only serves to hurt its general vibe and pacing. Like playing The Last of Us on the highest difficulty has its merits, but for many, it will lead to getting torn apart by clickers so many times nah, that they forget what shitty. Joel and Ellie are even trying to do. That's getting shitty. Getting through these encounters will probably feel satisfying to a degree, but it will come at the cost of the game's story. Especially because this is a game about the pacing and the story. Dying over and over on a couple of regular enemies is not, there's no joy in that. You don't feel great about beating them. And also, uh, I think worse is that like the way a game like this handles difficulty, I'm pausing a lot, I gotta move on, but they make bullet sponges. If the difficulty was like three more enemies or they have fucking extra spikes on their head or something, but just like cranking up the fucking health they have is whack. It's like, it, because even if you're playing better, the fights take longer and they're slow. Like it's, not, it's actually worse immersion. Story, which I'd argue is a much more important aspect, especially during a first playthrough. As for turning the difficulty up, I'm often resistant to do this as well because I never know what's coming up ahead. If I bump it up, then the next area is far more challenging, I may have to turn it back down again, which would feel kind of bad. Furthermore, I worry that jumping between difficulties might undermine certain moments. If a section feels especially easy or hard, there very well could be an intended and important reason for that. A pretty famous example of this sort of thing can be seen with God of War 20 18 when Kratos is preparing to go to Helheim. In order to weather the conditions of the realm of the dead, he has to retrieve the Blades of Chaos, weapons from his past that he hopes to keep buried. On the way to get them, he's confronted by a group of Hellwalkers, all of whom are resistant to the icy nature of the Leviathan Axe, essentially forcing the player to use Kratos' fists and shield to take them out. This leads to a pretty grueling and demanding fight, where the weapon you've come to rely on is useless. Then after getting the Blades of Chaos, Kratos is attacked by another group of Hellwalkers, and all the tension and frustration that was built up from the previous <laughs> fight is immediately unleashed oh, as Kratos slices the through them with ease, I demonstrating see. a clear increase to his power that thematically aligns smart, with the narrative. Smart. But if you were to lower the difficulty to get through the first fight more easily and raise it during the second so it would be more of a challenge, what this the sequence wouldn't be nearly as... What the fuck was this 900-page fucking article? I was recording an ironic Genshin wishlist video while doing a Fursona tier list. Good, good on you. Good luck. Yeah, uh, you got banned. Yeti banned you. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Yeti banned you. That's tough. Admittedly, it is unlikely that That's someone tough. will change the difficulty during this section as it isn't long enough to cause so much frustration that they feel the need to switch, but just knowing that games do this sort of thing always makes me wonder if I'm in the middle of a sequence that will soon have a big payoff or playing on the wrong difficulty. Even if I didn't let these mind games get in my way, changing from one difficulty to the next doesn't even guarantee that it will balance things perfectly, as there are so many different aspects of a game that can affect how easy or hard it is, and in a lot of cases, changing the difficulty will shift all of them. 
them. So if you're playing an action adventure title on medium and feel like the puzzles are the exact right amount of challenge, but the combat seems trivial, changing it to hard may address your issues with fights, but it might come at the cost of puzzles becoming frustrating. The best way to solve this problem is they by ever making changed the difficulty puzzles for difficulty? The game highly customizable. When players are able to adjust specific aspects no, like how aggressive enemies God. are or how much time they have to no, solve that's puzzle, not a solution. or the amount of experience they get from winning a fight, it makes it possible Bro, for- how am I supposed to know that as a player? I gotta figure out whether I want them to be fucking grounded attackers or what? That, that, that's a, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> that is such a complex solution that puts so much onus on the player to design their experience. For any given player to balance the game in a way that is just right for them. At least that's how it works in theory. But I found that in practice, it's much more complicated. Than uh, that. Okay. I do appreciate the <laughs> idea of being given full control over my experience, but more often than not, having these options quickly becomes overwhelming. Because when playing a yeah. game for the first time, I have no idea. Don't set what up a question like that the and then say experience. And frankly, I probably wouldn't fully know on a second playthrough either. <laughs> more options may give players the capability to perfectly balance the difficulty of the game, I didn't let but him that cook. doesn't mean they have the know-how to actually do it. Now, if there are just a few options to pick from, it probably won't be that tough to figure out what to adjust. But the fewer options there are, the more likely it'll be to run into the same issues as games that don't have any customization. When there are a wide range of options, though, it can take a ton of trial and error. Is he going to talk about Resident Evil 4 and its auto-scaling difficulty? Where if you're getting your fucking ass kicked, it like starts removing enemies and they they walk slower? Are you going to talk about this? Okay. Right. Or to figure out what works best. To see how different settings interact with each other to augment the difficulty. And I think for most players, putting a bunch of effort into troubleshooting a game's difficulty in the hopes of finding the right balance isn't how they want to spend their time. They're not the game designers. They don't have a good grasp of right. how any small change may impact their long-term enjoyment. Also, constantly modifying various aspects of a title to see what works best can create a disjointed experience, yeah. and that might make it it's harder cringe. to this get is into the... or appreciate I don't know what fucking game this is, but this menu would make me want to quit. <laughs> This is bullshit, dude. I don't want I do not want to pick all this shit. I want you to design an experience. Title. At the end of the day, most people just want to play video games without having to think about it. To clarify, I'm not trying to advocate that games should never include this kind of customization. Honestly, I really do like the idea of it, and I imagine there are plenty of players out there who get a lot of value from being able to make these small, specific adjustments. Really? However, I've learned that I don't enjoy the process of figuring it out, which typically leads to me ignoring them, but still always wondering if I can make things better. In general, it's kind of nice when I am not solely in charge of the decision, when the game gives some sort of feedback of what is right for me. One approach like this is when a game puts the player through some type of measurable test in order to judge their skill. Ooh. The first time I ever experienced something like this was in Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare. The intro puts the player through a typical tutorial assault course, and the recommended difficulty is determined by how quickly they clear it. This seems like a great approach- Is there a speedrun of this? I want to watch it right now. COD 4 intro speedrun. It's the most played speedrun in COD 4. Well, I found one in world record 8.7 seconds. Let's go! That's sick. I like that he finished it before the guy was done talking. <laughs> He's saying hit the targets after you're fucking done standing in front of his face. Punch is ninth in this? Rank ninth. FNG training course. Player punch. Verified one year ago. Description, I am unemployed. <laughs> Damn. One year ago, huh? All right, let's see it. Wait, it's a different game. Is it? Hits the targets. Okay. Nice, nice. <laughs> couple micro mistakes, couple micro mistakes. We all saw them. Not a big deal. You were 0.3 seconds slower than the world record, and we could tell immediately. But top 10. Can't go wrong with top 10. Approach, as instead of making the player judge how good they are, the game itself takes a sample of their gameplay and tells them how prepared they will be for the challenges in store. Of course, while this is an intriguing approach, it doesn't mean that it comes with no issues or uncertainties. For instance, judging someone on how good they are at a game when they're first getting the hang of it isn't the best sample of their actual skill. If a player runs through the course once while still figuring out the basics and doesn't give it another try, there's a chance they'll be recommended too low of a difficulty. On the other hand, if a player does what I did 
did the first time I played COD 4 and stubbornly grind the course over and over <laughs> again until they practically memorized it and can do it fast enough to be recommended veteran, then they will almost certainly be setting themselves up for failure. As doing Wait, that doesn't why? actually make them good at the game. No, but if you're the type of person who does that, you're the type of person who probably wants veteran. That actually makes a lot of sense. If you're going to grind it anyway... It... Game. It just makes them good at that very specific challenge. The tutorial does test the player's reaction time and how well they can position themselves, but it doesn't account for other important aspects like their decision making or ability to avoid taking damage. It is just one small piece of what makes a player good at the game. Is veteran COD bullet sponges? Or what, what is the deal with veteran COD? And this sort of approach becomes even more questionable when looking at titles that don't rely on precision or quick reflexes in the way that shooters do. Take The Witcher 2 Enhanced Edition, which Is came out a little- Is it like, uh, my closest experience would be Halo? Worse. Worse than Halo? On Legendary? I mean, Halo's pretty brutal on the highest difficulty because you get one tap by a lot of things, and it's really annoying little under a year after the base game, and added a tutorial that has Geralt fighting in an arena against various enemies and monsters. At the end of it, the player is put up against a handful of foes that get increasingly more powerful, and the more enemies they are able to kill, the higher the recommended difficulty will be. However, the arena is not really representative of how Wait, players is... will normally approach combat, as it mostly ignores the whole preparation aspect of the game. Also, the tutorial has no way of assessing the way in which the player kills or dies to the various enemies which can lead to a bad recommendation. Generally, a player with a fair bit of skill is more likely to take risks, and even though they may have a grasp over the combat, as they are playing more aggressively, there is a higher chance of them making a small mistake that costs them their life. Okay, Whereas well. someone with less skill who plays as cautiously as possible could theoretically take out each of the enemies if they have enough patience. <laughs> and due to how The Witcher 2 recommends difficulty, both players would be given settings that don't make sense for them. This can have a ton of consequences. One of the most notable being that it might condition the less skilled player to approach every encounter as conservatively as possible, which right. isn't how the game was really designed to be played. Of course, all these titles do still give players the option to pick whatever difficulty they want, but it's hard to go against what a game recommends, as you'd assume it has a better idea about things than you do. Even though this That's approach is cool, levels. it clearly is not the most effective way to determine player skill, and I think the fact that more games don't use it is proof of that. The reality is, with most titles, there just isn't a good way to measure a player's skill quickly. Frankly, one of the most important things a player can have is game knowledge, which is a hard thing to test for, especially in a tutorial. And that's why assessing a player's skill for a longer amount of time and- That's why at the beginning of every game, all players should be required to read the full wiki. <laughs> and it should like eye track you to make sure you can't skip. And you have to watch a full wiki on all the mechanics and items and how they're used, including spoilers. And then you have to watch a YouTube guide from Fextral life and then you are allowed to play further into a game leads to better results. The way this is typically done is by dynamically shifting the difficulty based on how well or poorly the player is doing. Most games have this to a degree, although we don't always think of it as a difficulty modifier. For example, a lot of titles will drop more health or ammo when you're low on one or the other. While it's easy to just see this as common sense and not something tied to difficulty, if a player is constantly out of ammo, there's a good chance it's partially because they are inaccurate with their shots. And if they're always low on health, it most likely means they're taking hits they don't need to, so being given these things as a result essentially makes things easier for them. It's a small adjustment that doesn't shift the core gameplay, but it does balance things out for those who aren't as skilled. There are, of okay. course, far more impactful implementations of dynamic difficulty. Take the Resident Evil series. Depending oh, on how accurate your shooting is and how often you take damage or get killed, enemy behavior and even the amount of them will change, making things more manageable for those who struggle by having enemies be less aggressive Wait, and they, giving a nice bit of- They do this in Resident Evil 8? Two? I thought it was just four. I thought it was just four. Extra challenge for those that have things down by making the baddies more hostile. On paper, adaptive difficulty is perfect, as it takes the decision out of the player's hand by making adjustments based on their actual performance over a long portion of time. Most Resident Evil titles do still have difficulty options, but players don't need to be as exact with their guesses of what's right for them. No, this is the eight. Game will this is not four. A more comfortable spot. An approach like this helps preserve game feel and flow, keeping the pace of a game as smooth and as enjoyable as possible. Sheesh. And when looking at a title. Wait, like I never Resident beat Evil this. 4, which is maybe the I never beat the new RE4. That was fun as shit. Well, I should play this. Best paced game ever made. It's a hard idea to argue with. 
Also, as it is done subtly and isn't something Capcom seemingly ever talks about, most players won't even notice it. So clearing sections even after they've been made easier feels just as satisfying because the player will assume they finally got good enough This to game is dumb it. fun. The thing is, and maybe this makes me a stubborn old man, most of the time I don't want to feel as if I've gotten good enough to overcome something. I want to get good enough to <laughs> overcome something. And it's not even about the principle of the matter. It's just that I like figuring things out. And if I know the game is figuring some of it out for me, I feel a bit cheated. Oh, I care yeah. about this sort of thing more with some titles than others, but in general, I'd rather avoid it. Now, I personally don't mind when a game gets harder if I'm playing well, as like I said, I enjoy getting past things by the skin of my teeth, but a part of me doesn't love the idea Yikes. of getting bumped up to a harder difficulty and then having that new challenge be taken away if I'm not immediately successful at it. <laughs> right. It's also worth noting <laughs> that the increased challenge could push players to approach encounters in a more cautious way that they find less enjoyable. This may make them more successful, but that's not necessarily the same thing as having more fun. All things considered, for a lot of people, especially those who don't really care about these things, adaptive difficulty is one of the better approaches. But for me personally, with I most games- know. I guess what I, I guess I don't mind it. I just don't want to know about it. <laughs> Cause if RE8 had it, I certainly didn't know it. I thought it was the same. Yeah, I don't know. I'd always rather play with it off as I want all the credit to go to me. But I don't think the majority of titles that incorporate some form of it would really want to have a visible toggle as drawing attention to it takes yeah, you away don't want a lot to even of mention magic. It. For all these reasons, as irrational as it may sound, a part of me prefers when a game has no difficulty options. Yeah! I like not having to worry whether or not I'm playing with the right settings or if the game yeah. is making things easier for me without me knowing. The experience is what it is, and there's something yeah. to that simplicity. You know what? It's like a fucking, if a movie director asked you at the beginning of a show, you go to the theater and you sit down, they're like, hey, do you want a happy ending or a sad ending? <laughs> like, which one are you in the mood for? And like, tries to, <laughs> I, it's your fucking art. Like, I want you to just pick something, make an experience, and then I'll play it. I don't want to have to pick. That would be sick. No, that would not be sick, bro. I don't want to pick, dude. I want the person making the thing to depict it. I want to- of nice. I think in some cases, it also pushes people to embrace a game's difficulty in a way they might not have had there been options. And yeah, I'm sure you knew I'd get here sooner or later, but this is the part of the video where I start talking about Dark Souls. The Souls series, <laughs> and really every modern FromSoft title, has become the centerpiece of difficulty discourse. And that's because the relentless nature of these games is one of the major reasons many have become so attached to them. There is something about their cruel and bleak worlds that is strangely compelling, and the gameplay feeds into that feeling so well. They present so many challenges that take a ton of Sekiro, to go game. So getting to the point where you are able to game. overcome them feels incredible. With most titles, the gap between having and not having a great grasp of the core gameplay is going to be noticeable, but more often than not, people in either camp will still be able to progress. But with Dark Souls, that is not the case. That gap makes all the difference in the world, and while there are multiple approaches of how to close it, at one point or another, the player has to figure out how to do it. And when they do, that feeling is unforgettable. Before playing Facts. Demon's Souls for the first time, I didn't think hard games were my thing, but it proved to me that they could be. And playing Dark Souls made it clear that I didn't just like them, but that they had the potential to be the most meaningful gaming experiences I've ever had. All right, I'll beat Liza P. <laughs> Bro, I'll do it, all right? I'll fucking yeah. beat it. With Demon's Souls I'll in play particular, Liza P. had it been designed we'll play with tomorrow. difficulty options, I don't know for sure whether or not I would have switched. Do I have to do anything tomorrow? I'm, I'm going climbing tomorrow. Maybe I'll just come back and go live to a lower one, but I definitely would have been constantly questioning if I had picked the right choice. Instead though, all I could really do was focus on finding a way through the game. I had to embrace its uncomfortable challenge or else be out 60 bucks. And that experience of going from thinking it- Wait, didn't I promise a fucking East Coast slot stream on the 11th? You know what? Let me check right now because now I'm kind of excited. I want to fucking play some games. I feel like I'm not gaming enough. 20 minutes later. Ladies and gentlemen, the 11th is confirmed. Oh, we are in the middle of the video. Actually, I have 20 minutes. If you don't mind, I'm actually enjoying this video and I forgot that it wasn't over. I just, it got to the Dark Souls part. <laughs> be impossible to scraping and climb my way to every every video essay about gaming must inevitably have a 20 minute dark Souls section and i got i just assumed that that was the end because we've heard this credits meant a lot to me and i know this is not a unique occurrence almost everyone i've talked to about these titles who's fallen in love with them has gone through something similar and a lot of the time what they got out of it transcended the game itself 
From helping people cope with depression and anxiety to teaching them that even when something seems impossible, it can still be overcome, these games have grown to mean so much more to people than just a way to spend their spare time. While it isn't the only factor, the unyielding nature of these titles is a big reason why people- To be clear, I agree with all this, it's just that I've heard this. You know, this is, this is something, I think we just recently watched a video essay that was like exactly this. And so it's like, love I love them so much. And having I a agree with this totally. It's just like, I've, I've heard it, so I've said possible. it. And it's, of course, mm. the consequence of being designed in this way is that it creates a skill window the player must fit within in order to stand a reasonable chance of enjoying the gameplay. As nice as it is to not spend time thinking about whether you chose the right setting or not, the trade off is there's a chance you'll be questioning whether you are the right player for the game or not. When a title has a set difficulty that's on the more punishing side of things, by design, it will be less approachable than a game that has options and some players just won't have the skill it takes to get through it. And that idea is daunting and can make it hard to want to engage with them in the first place. With that said, when it comes to a lot of titles that fall into this camp, like Dark Souls and pretty much everything else FromSoft has put out in the past 15 years, the skill needed in order to play and enjoy them isn't nearly as high as their reputation makes it out to be. Many people agree with that, but also want to say like, this is the dirty secret of it. And I guess I'll just be the fucking brave enough one to say it. And I don't like the people that are fucking difficulty gatekeeping weirdos online. But also as human beings, we define this stuff in relation to other human beings. So the fact that some people can't beat it and don't like it and like get turned out and lose is what makes it satisfying. When you beat it and then someone else can't, it makes you feel accomplished. If everybody beats it, it doesn't feel like anything. I think some people get fucking take this way, way too far. They're assholes about it and they're weird and they're lame and they make the community worse. But also at some level, at some base level, if it wasn't hard enough to dissuade somebody, then it wouldn't be hard enough to be satisfying. That's like, that's how it works. People do choose to play them in a way that requires high skill and proficiency, but aside from arguably Sekiro, FromSoft has always designed their games in a way that gives many different options to players so they aren't stuck with an approach that's not well suited for their skill set. It's just that these are chosen through the gameplay instead of an options menu. Looking at Dark Souls specifically, you don't need to just tackle it with a sword. There are solid ranged options as well as a ton of powerful spells, both of which allow players to keep distance from enemies while still being able to do damage. Most likely, neither will fully replace the need to engage Sekiro in was fun. combat, but using them Sekiro will was fun as shit. Frequent, letting the player stay out of harm's way more often. Using these mechanics doesn't make the game- Sekiro honestly makes me a little angry because it's like it shows me what games could be. <laughs> like imagine if there was like a hundred games that had the polish and fucking level of craft that went into that. It's crazy. I mean, it's just such a good game. It's actually such a fucking good game. It's such a fun and good game that feels really polished and and complete. I don't know. I just, I thought that game was so great and not many things are close. Challenging, but as they don't- Much like Fortnite. Yeah, that's big too. Fortnite and Sekiro don't require the same level of precision that fighting an enemy with just a sword does, they do make it possible for players that don't have a quick reaction skill set to find success. The most useful mechanic to help players overcome tough challenges though is the summoning system, which allows them to fight alongside NPCs or even other players. Having a summon does increase the health of bosses, but the vast majority of the time, that shift doesn't come close to outweighing the benefit that comes from having a partner. Playing with a summon fundamentally changes the dynamics of every encounter, it becomes less about fully learning a boss's moveset and more about capitalizing on the moments that their focus is on the other person. This doesn't lead to fights being mindless, but it does make it easier to find an opening to attack. NPC summons are available for many of the bosses and player summons can be placed at pretty much any of them. So with enough luck, there will be an option to bring in some help. In general, I find this approach to be pretty cool as it pushes players to discover what mechanics are best suited for them. Getting stuck is an opportunity for the player to assess all of the options at their disposal and utilize whatever ones will help them move forward. Or at least that's how it's supposed to work. But in reality, it isn't nearly that clean. Dark Souls doesn't do a whole lot to explain anything really. So for a first time player, it can be unclear how to engage with systems like magic and especially <laughs> summoning. All these, uh... Neither is super complicated <laughs> and the game does do a handful of things to try to what get players deprived? to across how both work. But this approach makes them easy to overlook or even miss, causing new players to be far more likely to default to simpler options like melee. For many, the way they'll learn how these things work is by looking them up, which I don't think is entirely a bad thing as the sharing of knowledge helps build community and that has no doubt played a big role in Dark. <laughs> 
Souls growing such a strong one. It's funny that Dark Souls offloaded all of the tutorial mechanics and lore off to the internet. <laughs> and said, we, we can't figure out how to make these fit in the game, so we'll just... But also, it can be frustrating when mechanics <laughs> that you guys figure it out. either take a bit of luck or an external source to figure out. Also, as far as summoning goes, it relies on having humanity, which is a relatively scarce resource. So if a player runs out, they no longer can get assistance until they find more. Mix this with being susceptible to getting invaded when in human form, and it creates a bunch of hoops struggling players need to jump through to get the help they need. And some of those hoops just aren't very fun. Like in order to be able to use summons consistently, struggling players will probably need to farm humanity, which sucks because killing these stupid rats over and over again <laughs> is not compelling gameplay. Play. Is the compelling gameplay. The greatest thing you can do in any video game is kill level one rats on mass to farm something. They figured it out early. They figured it out often. Everyone knows that is a that is the that's the top of the pyramid of good game design. But a decent amount of people will feel incentivized to do it anyway. And this is a major problem that comes from using they have to be rats. as a way to incentivize engaging with the title's various mechanics. It can instead lead to unfortunate player behavior. When I think back to my first experience with Demon Souls, as much as I find myself romanticizing it now, I didn't really find the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay to be all that fun. I never got good at fighting, and I died so many times that I barely even had the option to use summons. So to get through the game, I did stuff like this. And this. And that stuff this. can be fun, though. I would grind the that shit can actually be really fun. Far too it's long still satisfying. To get souls to level up and buy as many arrows as I could afford in order to cheese bosses. This isn't an invalid way to play Demon Souls, Dark Souls, or any of the others. But it, this is only unfun when someone tells you how to do it. But if you're a player and you're stuck on a boss and suddenly you find like a corner they can't hit you in or a place you can shoot arrows and you beat them, it actually feels incredibly satisfying because it feels like you're being creative. Like you got one up on the developer. It's very cool. If it happens every single time, I can see it being annoying. But every time in my life that I've found something like this, it feels awesome. It feels really cool. It's like a unique thing. The only thing that sucks is when someone tells you. It's like, oh, just go to the corner and do this. Then you feel like it's fucking lame. <laughs> Then it sucks all the joy out of it and you're just accomplishing a cheat. You kind of have to invent your own cheese for it to be fun. As someone who has now beaten pretty much everything FromSoft has recently put out, I do think it is the least enjoyable approach. However, for some players, it will feel like the only approach. And depending on their skill, it might be. While I do like the Dark Souls design philosophy of presenting all players with the same challenge and giving them a wealth of gameplay options so they can find what works best for them, it does have the potential to create a disconnect between how a player wants to play and how they like sometimes when you're fighting a boss in a game near a ledge or something and then something glitches or goes wrong and they fall off and die <laughs> like you've been struggling on this boss but this time they fall off and die and you get an instant win you it's like a huge hilarious moment you laugh out loud it's super funny it's great it's just emerging yeah it's emerging gameplay that's fucking awesome need to play. Like, it's great that summons are an option, but as I said before, they do fundamentally change how boss fights work, and it leads to a much different experience than fighting them solo. There is nothing wrong with either approach, however, if a player prefers what combat feels like without having a summon, but gets completely stuck on every boss they try to take on alone, they'll kind of be forced into using one if they want to progress. And as using summons is so different, doing no. this won't really help them get better at fighting bosses alone, so it doesn't even act as a way to build up to a new challenge. On the other end of things, more skilled players who enjoy summons, whether it be for lore or gameplay reasons, may feel like they can't really use them without things getting too easy. Obviously, they can just do a second playthrough with summons that's less focused on the challenge, but I don't think it's ideal that they'll feel the need to ignore the mechanic on their first in order to maintain a certain level of difficulty. In FromSoft's pursuit of having follow. everyone face the same challenge, players are pushed towards or away from certain mechanics largely because of their skill and not their preferred playstyle. Depending on what group they fall into, they'll okay, have completely well, different. I don't know if I agree with that because that implies that skill is like a fixed thing. I think the whole point, like the whole, all of the video essays about Dark Souls and all of the fucking good that it says it comes from it comes from the fact that people recognize, they wake up to the fact <laughs> through a video game that skill is not a fixed thing and it's something you can practice and improve. I think that's the, the best thing the games have ever done for anybody is that they've wakened them up to the fact that you can be bad at something, practice it, and then get good at it. And you can do that with anything in your life.
experiences that don't really resemble each other in any notable way. I don't think this is inherently a bad thing. For many players, this approach will get- Some people really don't want to grind a boss in an hour straight to beat a boss like you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, listen, I, I, again, I, I have no problem with someone using summons or magic or whatever. I've never been a fucking gatekeeper. But I do think that is what, if there's any like real life beauty of these games, I think that's what it is get them to engage with the game in the way that's best suited for them. But for others, it will make them feel like they're only left with bad options. Some players just won't have the skill to beat bosses alone without putting in far more time than the vast majority of people. So it makes a lot of sense to me why someone in that position- All right, Atrock, I put you on the main monitor now. You're welcome. Sorry for the pressure though. <laughs> All right, guys, let's kick into high gear. Let's kick it in high gear. We're on Digital Dylan's main monitor. Okay, we're gonna need the best jokes from chat. Snappy, no, no more sitting around. Right, I'm gonna react as hard as I can. Would want there to be multiple. This is main monitor situation. If alert, they could alert, drop alert. Down to a lower setting that, among other things, had them deal more damage and take less of it. They'd be able to less overcome bosses in a time frame that more closely resembles what it takes for the average player, more while still average experiencing player. Poor gameplay of solo what? combat. And more like average glizzy. <laughs> This is that main monitor energy, baby. Wait, this is something people can do in Dark Souls. It just requires grinding, <laughs> a solution that comes at the cost of the core gameplay loop turning into a tedious waste of time. I know some people will say that these kinds of games just aren't for these kinds of players, but I don't think it's that simple. Not being good at something doesn't mean you can't love it. Feeling skilled out of a game you adore has to be frustrating, especially because there is so much more to these titles than them just being hard. True. And honestly, this is something FromSoft seems to be very conscious of based on how the design of their games has shifted over the Yeah, I think years. Elden Ring handled this, this really well. This is best seen with Elden Ring, ah, which pretty okay. effectively <laughs> addresses some of the pain points that are common for less experienced players. Yeah, like Elden Ring was uh... fashion, they even managed to do it without including traditional difficulty settings. Progress on the main quest is gated by a series of extremely difficult bosses. The first and arguably <laughs> harshest being Margit. Trying to take any of them on without being properly prepared will most likely lead to failure. So players are incentivized to explore the lands between to collect nah. runes, weapons, nah. and all sorts of other resources <laughs> in order to get strong enough to nah. take on the challenge of the mandatory bosses. Nope. The difficulty pushes them to engage with the open world, which is great as it's Elden Ring's most interesting no, aspect. Thank you. There are so many things to do and many of them are Doesn't manageable sound fun challenges to me. even for less skilled players. While some endeavors will be more rewarding for certain builds than others, players will almost always walk away with their character being stronger than they were before. The answer to getting stuck is to check out somewhere else, and this is a much more satisfying solution than grinding the same group of enemies over and over again. For those who struggle with these games but don't enjoy using summons, this gives them a way to still play on their own without spending time doing repetitive activities. Yeah. As for summons, Elden Ring adjusted how they work to make them far more reliable. NPC summons don't require the use of an item, so using them is always an option. Player summons are still tied to one, but it's so easy to get that it's rarely a barrier, and of course, spirit ashes can be used pretty much on every boss, and they offer a wide range of companions to choose from that can help with various challenges. They also can be upgraded, making them a- I didn't end up using spirits, but I think the idea of having different kinds of spirits that are good at different things is cool, because then it becomes almost like there's some level of skill to it. You know, you don't just pick one thing and then slam it down mid the whole time. You like have some choices, which is kind of cool. I think they could have leaned into that even more. like make them all slightly weaker but have certain really unique strengths so you get the mimic thing yeah i never used that but i understand that it was like broken but they nerfed it or something right a very powerful part of the like pokemon arsenal. in a way all of this not only expands the skill window significantly but it also gives players more viable and interesting ways to handle the challenge now as much as i wish i could say that this is the perfect approach unfortunately it does create some issues uncovering the secrets of the lands between was my favorite part of the game so i wanted to do a ton of it but as exploring had a direct correlation to my character's strength that resulted in me getting over leveled quickly. Enemies and bosses don't scale as you level up, which can make a lot of them become trivial. For the middle chunk of the game, I found everything I came across to be pretty easy. I I'm sorry for your problem here, but I don't care. <laughs> and I mean that sincerely. I think scaling boss difficulty to your level is the worst fucking mechanic ever. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. I think it's the it's the worst. To me, it's like the most fun sapping thing. I, if you're going to over level, then things are going to get easy. And that's fine. Like I, I, That's fine. <laughs>
The game should not balance around that. Everything feeling like this bland, I don't know, this, this fucking milk toast level artificial uh, scaling sucks. You never feel stronger, you never feel weaker. Like there's two really fun emergent gameplay that happens when you don't have level scaling, especially in an open world game. It's where you can wander into an area that you're not ready for and get your fucking ass kicked. And it's like, holy shit, this place is real. Like for story reasons, for lore reasons, it's cool to wander into a fucking cave or a volcano or something and get your fucking ass kicked. It's like, oh shit, this place is another level. I need to be ready. That's cool. And then the second thing is, whenever you fucking, at the end of the game, and you're strong as shit, and you've like been through all these journeys, and you have these swords, and you happen to walk back through the starting area, and you just beat the shit out of everything, you're like, wow, I feel the power gap. I am so much stronger than I was before. You feel the growth. <laughs> Scaling removes both of those scenarios. You're, you'll walk into the fucking deep, dark volcano at the end of the game, and everything's level one, because you're level one, and they're all fucking easy. That sucks. And you'll get super strong, come back to the town, like in Skyrim at the beginning, and everyone's wearing fucking diamond armor, the bandits. It's it's stupid. <laughs> it, it destroys my immersion. I was able to muscle through boss fights on my first try without having to learn how they work or even really be cautious. This put me in a spot where I felt like I had to choose between exploring and having things feel Yeah, the mithril armor bandits, yeah, bummer, yeah, yeah. As those are my two favorite things about the game. One of my friends ran into a similar issue and actually decided to stop upgrading his maiden weapon so that things wouldn't get too easy. I thought about doing the same, but I ended up not, as I like the feeling of my character progressing. Seeing number go up yeah. is part of what motivates me, and choosing to opt out of certain upgrades would cause exploring to be a little pointless. While I wish I could explore stuff for the sake of exploring, I am very extrinsically motivated, so it just didn't seem like a good option. Also, trying to balance the difficulty by only upgrading things to a certain point starts to feel a lot like games with tons of difficulty options that can be adjusted, and just like with that, how am I supposed to know what the right balance will be? I know some people will say do whatever is the most fun, but I have no idea how to figure that out without spending a bunch of time testing stuff, and that's not what I wanted to do. Elden Ring is a much smoother experience than FromSoft's previous titles, but it still runs into the same issue that pretty much every game with a single set difficulty does, of players needing to moderate what systems they engage with if they want to have things be a proper challenge. And that's especially a bummer when one of those systems is the best part of the game. So what? Would adding difficulty options be a way to fix these issues? And I mean, yeah. They would fix a lot of them, but then there would Cause be new problems. ones yeah. that would be solved by not having difficulty options. The reality is, it's all kind of bad. There are problems with every approach, and it is unlikely that a game will ever feel perfectly balanced. Of course, in uh, a lot of- One thing I do want to say, though, while we're on this subject, is I am a personal hater of the leveling up your weapon mechanic in Souls-like games and any other game that does it. I think it fucking makes no sense to me. I hate it. I, I don't, it like actively discourages experimentation and because it's so important to your damage, at some point, unless you're actively picking up all the little stones, I just don't get it. I don't, you already have a character level up thing. Why can't we just front load the damage to your strength stat and not to your, I don't, I don't understand why it needs to be in the weapon. I don't get it. I don't get why it needs a second level. I, I'm sure there's a game design reason and I'm sure it has some benefits but to me, I find it so annoying because I would love to experiment more. I like getting better gear, but even still, like, you know, um, one thing Elden Ring kind of suffers with, this is a very small, minor nitpick, but like, once you have a weapon you like, the rewards in like a random chest are almost always useless. Like, you don't need many things. <laughs> like, all the, all the shit you get is often, you, there's like a lot of empty shit they have to fill chests with that aren't that useful. And so it would be cool if instead there was more weapons, <laughs> almost like Borderlands, you know, where I could find a rarer weapon that's kind of cool. I don't know. I, anyway, I'm just not a fan of it. I don't know if I have a perfect solution to solve it because I get why on some level it exists. But for me, I find it annoying. In instances, it will be close enough. I do want to make it clear that the challenge of finding the perfect way to balance difficulty in video games is not an epidemic or anything that severe, but it is a problem that lacks an ideal solution. And frankly, there is so much more to it than what I've covered here. This whole video looks at balance from the perspective of players wanting a challenge that feels suited for their skill level, but in reality, that's not what everyone Silk wants. Song win! Some people love the power fantasy of decimating everything they come in contact with, and others like feeling powerless in whether or not what they do will help them succeed. Or at least I assume they do, otherwise I don't know why anyone would still be playing League. And hey! on that note, there's a ton to be said about how to balance the 
the difficulty of multiplayer games, because for someone to win, a different person has to lose. This is made more complicated by the fact that an evenly balanced lobby is not necessarily a fun lobby, as it can lead to a playstyle that is overly sweaty and disincentivizes doing anything outside the meta. But the So I thought, I thought about this as well. I'm solving all the problems today. So there's a real problem with people complain about skill-based matchmaking, where they feel they have to sweat every time because they're always placed against someone of their skill level. So they can never just swag out. And the solution in secret for some people was for like them to create bot enemies, like in Fortnite. If they create bots, then you can swag out on them and they'll always be bad and you'll feel good until you realize they're bots and then you feel like shit. The solution, and I figured it out, Epic Games, instead of wasting hundreds of millions of dollars on the Epic Game Store, which is still unprofitable, just hires a bunch of people to be humans, join your game and lose, okay? A professional class of people who will play bad but not quit so they don't churn out. So now everybody wins. Everybody, even the worst players, get to swag out on other human beings. Professional losers. Because the type of person that would take this job might be a professional loser in real life, we're giving them an employable job. We're creating jobs for real life losers to become professional losers. Thus solving employment problems, purpose problems, and improving games. Games. I swear to God, right now the system does exist. Riot uses it to find your teammates for Valorant and League. <laughs> But I'm talking about expanding it to everyone so you can actually use it to win instead of just lose. It's a great system. And I do think there's real potential in it. Alternative means a certain chunk of players will just always lose. So who should be prioritized? Additionally, it's important to consider how accessibility fits in, as even though it's different from difficulty and the two should not be conflated, there is overlap between them. The goal of accessibility options is to address specific issues and barriers that exist for different disabled players. And in some cases that involves including settings that impact difficulty. So developers also have to consider how best to implement these features so that they are actually effective tools for those who need them. Ultimately, there are so many things to consider when balancing a game, and there will always be some downside to Ima solving your purpose problems. Imagine going up to someone and saying your purpose is to always lose. You're framing it bad. Let me market it a little different to you. Imagine if your job is to make someone's day every day. Someone just got off work, long shift. They're sitting down to play Call of Duty. They're stressed. All they want to do is boot up and get a nice kill streak. You are helping make that person's day. You get to join into their game and be a part of the experience that makes their day a little brighter. Now they smile because they had a good day. <laughs> That's your job. You're basically a hero. Hero. Welcome to the professional loser queue. <laughs> You sit here for 18 hours a day and we'll pay you minimum wage. That's my Jeff speech. So whatever choice is made, there are just too many of us and we're too different for there to even be a chance. With that said, I think one of the best things developers can do is to make it clear to players what the intended experience is supposed to feel like. When they communicate their intentions, explain how different settings will impact the core experience, and at the very least, give more specific descriptions than you guys are getting hard, paid. <laughs> it goes a long way with helping players figure out what will make sense for them. <laughs> this is easier said than done for certain titles, as some games have pretty flexible intended experiences. But even then, the more the player knows, the easier it will be for them to choose what to go with. Personally, my favorite approach is when a game presents itself as having a single set difficulty, but whether it be through an assist mode or the accessibility options, also offers ways to shift things for those who need it. This approach makes it clear what the experience is supposed to be and challenges players of all skill levels to engage I'm with saying it. nothing. But it gives people the ability to choose how they want to play. If, if I speak, I'm in trouble. That. When presented in this way, <laughs> players will be less likely to use it on a whim and largely only turn to it when the alternative is quitting all I said nothing. It's of course, this approach approach has problems too. Like I said, they all do. It's impossible for things to not be a bit messy. Life is unbalanced, and so there will always be flaws so with the difficulty of a game. And unfortunately, that will get in the way of us being able to enjoy them at times. All we can really do Hades! is gravitate towards the approaches. Wait, is it Hades 2 like fucking soon? Is it this year? Why do I have in my mind that Hades launch is November 30th? Am I stupid? Why is that in my mind? Okay, it's Q2 2024. <laughs> Okay. Wow, I don't know. <laughs> uh, crazy. Thought for sure. Bother us the least and hope uh, that nothing too annoying gets in our way. Was it supposed to be this year? Die? Why does your mic sound so bad? Why do you care? I'm the one who has to listen to it. You should think about getting something better like the mod mic. This is this an ad? Ask me about the mod mic. <sighs>
What's the mod? The mod mic is here. Check out the mod mic. It's amazing. Thank you, Rasputin, for the video. I'm going to go hang out with Ari. It is 11. That was an interesting and fun discussion. And his videos always prompt those. Thank you again.